So we're gonna shift gears here a little bit, and as opposed to looking out towards other folks, we're gonna look internally and reflect on, well, how does decision analysis, how can it help us actually be better in what we do? In particular, in the sense of starting organizations and leading organizations. Now, we're fortunate to have a panel today of skilled decision analysis experts who've also had <laughs> impressive accomplishments in leading and managing organizations. So it's gonna be our job to figure out, okay, what's the magic these folks have? How do, we, how do we capture that? So I'm gonna do a couple of quick introductions here before we dive in. So first we have Victor Kush, who you just heard in the last panel, so now I get to have the control of the mic. Um, serial entrepreneur, he's built and sold multiple companies. So I've got this kindred spirit with him. So I'm also a serial entrepreneur. I've uh, built a number of companies, but he's got this like significant advantage on me called he sold his companies, which, which is, by the way, in entrepreneurship, this is an advantage. I'm looking forward to that sometime in the future. Um, no stranger to risk. So Victor was born in the Ukraine. I heard the story last night. And when he was a small child, his family, under somewhat perilous circumstances, came to the United States. And it seems like you know, this willingness to take risk is really built into Victor's character, as hardwired as an entrepreneur. So I do have a question for you, Victor. So what is this silver beaver thing that I see in your, uh, <laughs> your, your bio? <clears throat> well, I've, I've been a part of the Boy Scouts of America and am an Eagle Scout. Uh, started in scouting when I was nine years old. It's definitely one of the main things that uh, drove home that I'm an American. And you, know, you said I'm an immigrant, and uh, I consider myself an American. And so the Silver Beaver Award is the highest award that the Boy Scouts can give to a local volunteer. Great, thanks. Well, so next we have Jim Driscoll, who in this crowd needs no introduction. He's our esteemed president. But I do have a question. So Jim leads the group over at Intel and recently had a name change. So it used to be called the Decision Quality Program Office at Intel. And, and by the way, Jim, before I ask you to describe why you kicked DQ to the curb, let me just point out that the gentleman sitting to your side was one of the inventors of decision quality and has been promoting this language for the last 20 years. We have not kicked it to the curb. <laughs> we love DQ. So, so, so what's the new name? Uh, we're called the Intel Center for Decision Leadership. And we have a little bit different definition of decision leadership than um, maybe some others, so maybe we'll tell you a little bit about that. But. Uh, we think it uh, gives us a little bit broader ability to uh, influence what goes on there. So. Great, thanks. We'll, we'll probably could be coming back to that. So, and then of course, we have Carl Spetzler, who also needs no introduction, the chairman and CEO of Strategic Decision Group, and frankly, one of the founders of the field, and you know, frankly, a lot of the reason why we're here, one of the reasons I'm here, actually, is because of Carl. And um, I, I view, really, Carl as being instrumental in the field of decision analysis from taking this academic foundation and making it practical. And, and I've had the privilege of seeing Carl in action in a couple of different contexts. I used to work at SDG, and I also was on the Decision Education Foundation board with Carl. And he's got this magic way of just cutting to the heart of an issue. And uh, you've actually been influential in terms of what I do in venture capital, so thank you for that. Um, now, I want to start with Carl. And you know, it'd be great to start with a little bit of an early uh, history lesson. So think back to the early days of getting SDG off the ground, and I'm you know, like, by the, by the way, so when was that? When was SDG off, so getting off the ground? SD, S, we formed SDG in 81, uh, but the predecessor organization was really the SRI group, uh, and that was started by Jim and Ron in 66, I believe, uh, and I joined them in 68. All right. But when we ran at SRI into uh, it being a research organization and compensation levels were limited because of all the technical research going on and you couldn't have these management consultants making twice as much, we kept losing our best staff for double compensation offers outside. Mm -hmm. And at some point I said, uh, I want to be able to work in a situation where we keep the best. 
All right. So that started SDG. All right. So, so let, let's paint the picture here. So <clears throat> sitting around the dining room table, it's you, Ron Howard, Jim Mathis. Who, who else is at this table at the beginning of SDG? Uh, Jeff Foran. But very quickly, there were a number of people that were near partner. It, it was like a magnet that people that had left earlier because of this compensation limitation and looking for opportunities that came back. Uh, uh, and, and some of the names would be well known here. Mike Allen was one of those, uh, Terry Bronstein. And so on. All right. So, so, so these are like a who's who in the beginning of decision analysis. Yes. So, how does your points of view about decision analysis show up in how you design the company SDG? Well, it, it's a combination, and let me say, decision analysis and a libertarian view of the world kind of have a connection. Okay. People value choices and want to make good choices, and they want to enable and give everybody as much of a choice in their life as possible. Okay? So I would say we designed the company, and we tried to make sense in a decision quality sense way. And we, right from the beginning, uh, people sometimes call it a servant leadership model. They call it a higher empowerment. We wanted the decision made out on the front line where people knew the most. And if something went wrong, we didn't centralize uh, in response, which is the natural response of an organization. You kind of centralize and so that this mistake can't happen again. Instead of that, we said, OK, go out there and uh, do it now that you've learned this lesson. Let's all learn the lesson from this. And therefore, we can give you even more power and we want people that have the judgment. I recall one time uh, somebody coming into my office, we've got to create a policy about travel. I ha I, I'm a partner and uh, I was sitting in coach and coming by this junior person that was sitting in first class from SDG. We cannot go on like this in terms of travel policies. This is crazy. And I said, gee, you want to trust someone to help clients make decisions and you can't trust them to make travel decisions? What do you want to tell them? Did you talk to them? No. I think we need a policy so I don't have to talk to them. <laughs> That's the kind of stuff where we pushed back very quickly and said, decisions out front, get it straight. And it led to a culture that was highly empowered. Great, great, thank you. So Victor, when you're starting a company, do you draw a decision tree? <laughs> I mean, how, how, how does you, well, what you know about decision analysis show up when you're trying to figure out which project you do next? So, so I've started six companies, and I would say right now I'm using a lot of what you've been doing and uh, helping mentor new entrepreneurs that are starting companies. But if you ask me going back, did I do that starting companies? No, never, <laughs> not once, right? Um, the way that DA would show up in terms of uh, the, the organizations that I grew was making major decisions about product, making major decisions about increasing sales capability, marketing capability. Uh, so in, in those cases, definitely. Mm -hmm. All right, so Jim, so you've got this, what was the name of the group again? The Center for Decision Leadership. Okay, Center for Decision Leadership. So how do the ideas of decision analysis show up in your leadership style and how you lead your group? Uh, well, we have a, I guess we might want to talk about decision leadership and then we can talk about how we think about that and how I try to live that with my group. I think. Um, you know, we, we look at decision leadership as the act of continuously improving the system of decision making in your organization. So decision, when we teach decision quality, we use decision quality, we love decision quality. But decision quality is kind of a con construct of how do I make this decision that's, that I'm facing right now really well? And it's very helpful for that. Uh, but I want to get my, you know, executives intel thinking about I want to have a conversation with them about how they want that system of decision making to work in their organization. 
because that opens up a lot more areas than just are we framing and do we have alternatives, uh, you know, and all the things that we talk about. It gets into how do you want to show up as the decision maker? How do you want to engage with your teams? How do you want to, how transparent are you willing to be? Who are you willing to involve, right? Why are you not willing to involve them, right? What decisions are you invo uh, avoiding? How are you helping those that are coming, uh, you know, that work for you and coming uh, behind you be better decision makers in their own right? And so it gets more at, a, at an organizational conversation about how you want decision making to work. And obviously we want DQ and, and all the things that we do to be heavily embedded there. Um, but you know, you get into things like data science, we've been talking about a lot. And we think that that system of decision making view, um, you know, for us now we're talking about how do we have decision driven data science, right? We've got data, dr data driven decision making Okay, what I want is decision-driven data science. That's, that's going to make sure that the, the data analysis we're doing is not waste. So we just think it opens up a lot more doors like that. For my group, um, you know, I think the things that we teach and use are really uh, helpful as a manager, as a leader, you know, being a decision-focused manager, right? Uh, if, if I'm asking my team for some information and I'm not going to change the decision, why am I asking <laughs> for that information? Um, if I give them an action item that is even marginally difficult, we will have a quick conversation about, they'll say, well, I think you're, you're, you've already made these three decisions. Is that right? Related to this one that we're, you're, you want me to go work on. And I think this other stuff we've been talking about is noise, right? And we, what we really need to do is, is tackle these three things that are related to this thing that you want me to go do. And so we're having that quick dialogue. We're basically doing the decision hierarchy right there in a matter of five or ten minutes and now they, they're much more effective going off and trying to get us, you know, to move forward. All right, breaking out the tools, love it. All right, so now we're going to sharpen things up a little bit here. And there's an adage in the law, my wife's a lawyer by the way, so I get this kind of stuff, and basically says a lawyer who represents themselves has a fool for a client. So Victor. When have you sort of come to the realization it's like, oh crap, I should have brought somebody in to help me with this? <laughs> um, on, on many occasions. And so what we did, like uh, at Caesar Systems, for example, whenever we would have an executive meeting, one of the people would put on the DA facilitator hat. And so uh, they would essentially take themselves out of the practitioner you know, perspective of I'm the decision maker and help us to think clearly about what the decision is and how we need to think about it. So we tried to do that certainly later on, but in the early days of any venture, it's very difficult to get outside help. Um, mm -hmm. You know, you often lean on mentors. If you're lucky enough to have a VC, you, le you lean on your uh, investors. And, um, but I think that entrepreneurs don't often think about getting external help. I, I think that um, startup companies think about any kind of consultant as somebody that goes to work for a corporation, not somebody that comes to help a startup. So, so Carl, I, I know inside SDG, you guys are very thoughtful about when you're wearing the decision maker hat versus the decision facilitator hat. When are you tempted to say, no, nah, I got this? Both the decision maker and the decision facilitator, and then in retrospect, you're like, oops, should be careful in those areas. Well, th there are many decisions where I want to be a player. And if I am in, and it is often in the partnership group, okay? If I want to be a player, I know I can't be the facilitator. You can't be an honest facilitator and a player. And so we differentiate that way. Uh, for us, the biggest challenge isn't applying these things to ourselves. It is that our taste for excellence is set by client work where we get paid $350,000. And we can afford the equivalent of 20 on our really big decisions. But the taste, everything, and it's very hard to deal with things in the, 
in the scale and the reduction for a, our size company when all the standards that are internal standards are built against what we have to deliver for clients. So to be agile and fast is, is, is I think, for an organization like SDG that focuses on strategic decisions, actually harder than what I see in the entrepreneurial space and, and the Silicon Valley and so on. So that's, that's a hard act for us. Hmm. And, there's nothing, about, there's uh, nothing harder than facilitating a group of facilitators, you know, <laughs> <laughs> or trying to make a decision with a bunch of decision professionals. <laughs> I think this holds for our society, too. Absolutely. <laughs> All right, so, so by the way, I've got a few more questions here, but feel free to send your questions in and I'll get to them here shortly. So let's flip it around. So, so when have you experienced, essentially, your knowledge of DA just being a huge competitive advantage? It's like you're crushing the competition because you know something they don't about you know, how to run your business. Uh, so, so, who, so who is your competition first, Jim, when you think about that? It's like, in, oh, if those pricing guys, if only knew what I knew, just like, pfft. Uh, my competition is the executive who believes that outcomes are the determinant of a good decision. Uh, you know, that's the, the biggest thing to get over. I think, um, you know, I'll, I'll give you... Uh, an example of how maybe I use this in starting the group. So when I um, figured out that I wanted to go do this, I spent a lot of time talking to uh, people that had been successful. Some of them are in the room here today at big companies. I also talked to people at companies where they had tried to do decision quality and had failed. And that was pretty instructive. And what I learned from that is the top bar of the tornado on whether this was going to work out was, was probably how I approached, you know, hooking my star to a single executive and, and trying to get a mandate quickly and, and then that executive leaves and now I'm adrift. And so, uh, you know, I think thinking about what are the big things if I launch into this uh, that could, you know, how could this go well, how could it go bad, what are the big risks, um, that changed our strategy. So we, we knew from the beginning that we wanted to try to infect Intel with DQ in so many different places that no one person could cut it out. And I wasn't beholden to the, the career of one executive to have this, uh, you know, be successful. Because that executive is going to leave and the new one's going to come in and say, well, Joe's gone, so we're not doing it that way anymore. Um, and so, you know, that's uh, what came to my mind is you say, how do we use this? Uh, you know, we're trying to change the culture of the company, some of the concepts from DQ and DA were helpful to me in thinking about how to start that group. Yeah. All right, so I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna make this question a little bit harder then. So Victor, have you ever fired someone for a bad outcome? <laughs> uh, very early on, absolutely. <laughs> um, so by, by the way, you think that was a mistake? You think firing people for a bad outcome is the wrong thing to do? Well, I, I think that it depends, right? So, um, in, in this particular case that I'm thinking of, the individual made a very costly error for the business, and it was clear that the individual made the error. So, uh, so there, there was cause to fire the individual for the bad outcome, right? Uh, it was also, I guess, a bad decision that drove the bad outcome. So, so you could you know, trace it back to that. I think later on, I held on to a lot of people that um, were making good decisions and not getting good outcomes, and that's not very healthy for a business either. So it's a very, ch it's a very challenging uh, situation in terms of decision making, um, particularly in entrepreneurial companies, uh, whether they're startups or not. A lot of times, we're on the precipice of death, right? <laughs> Be because you're, you're always growing fast and running out of money. And so, um, so those hiring decisions are, are, are a key thing in the business. Yeah. How about you, Carl? You ever fired anyone for a bad outcome? I can't think of a situation. You ever fired anybody? Oh, many. <laughs> so so, 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 they, good, they were good outcomes, but, just bad so, decisions? So, so let me say, and sometimes, uh, 
with great pain and regret because mm -hmm. I didn't want to, but business conditions required it. Okay, so it is, you know, uh, it can be outcomes from external uh, environment or performance or something as a, a, an organization as a whole, and you have to make some tough decisions when you're leading a business. So, uh, but I think in every one of them, I, I would try to be consistent with the philosophy of uh, it's not about outcomes, it's about decisions. And I think the way you answered the first one, you actually did link the outcome to the decision and the behavior or the mistake. But, but so, by the way, this was a know, trick question. I was, that's the, <laughs> you, you picked me, up on so, it. <laughs> uh, I, I had a lot of trouble with some uh, people that were describing that deliberate mistakes and decisions is something we should do so that we learn faster, okay? Uh, those kinds of things are kind of hard for me. It, if you're making a deliberate mistake <laughs> to get something, then you're making a good decision. It's not a deliberate mistake. You're just try doing what we call an experiment. But renaming that made a book very popular, mm -hmm. okay? So I, I think uh, I, I would not try to go make a deliberate mistake and I think firing somebody for outcomes when we believe the decisions and the behaviors were correct would not be the correct reason. All right, so we, we've got a trending question here from the audience. Jim, I'll direct this to you, but this is for all panelists. What was the worst decision you made as a leader and what did you learn from it? Man, I don't know. I got to think about this. Oh, so, so we'll, 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 go, we'll go to Victor here. I, I, I'm sure. I mean, Victor's I mean there's, there's my staff is over there laughing because there's, right. a, there's a treasure trove of them. <laughs> oh, maybe uh, some audience <laughs> participation in this one. Yes. <laughs> Worst decision Victor's I mean, ever uh, so I'll, I'll Jim's go, made. So I'll go back to the hiring. I'll go, I mean, I've made hiring mistakes. None of those people are here, so it's okay. <laughs> uh, you know, it's tempting to. Um, to hire up in our business, you know, especially at Intel, it's these quant somebody who's really quantitatively strong. And we learned early on that in order for us to be successful, I need a very unique person who has, can do the, the quantitative stuff, but also can do the soft skills around framing and, and being an, a consultant and really um, establishing trust and, and rapport. And, uh, you know, I sacrificed that uh, at times to my uh, detriment, my team's detriment. And so what we did is we changed our decision-making pro or our, our, um, our interviewing process uh, to try to address that. And um, we try to really to understand who this person is. You know, I can teach you the analytics. I can't make you a different person. So who, you know, our, question, our, our interviews are almost exclusively on who you are, why this is interesting to you, um, and, and what makes you tick, and then we'll teach you everything you need to know uh, when you get on board. And the other thing we do is, um, I don't even participate in the first rounds. My team does a panel interview, and if anybody gives a thumbs down, they don't go on to the second round. So uh, my entire team's involved in making sure uh, you know, that we're only taking candidates through that they want to work with, which has been a, a big help, I think. All right, Victor. Worst decision and what you learned from it. <laughs> so so uh, an, another hiring decision. So you know we talked in the previous panel about uh, firing CEOs and boards firing CEOs and uh, founders being open to the idea that they can be replaced and they need to be replaced. So I decided to replace myself with, as CEO in one of my companies. and. Um, I found that that wasn't actually a value-adding decision, even though I thought that it was going to be. And uh, so one of the things that I learned from that was that um, we often underestimate ourselves and think that others know better than we do. And uh, sometimes we just need to have a little bit more courage. Mm -hmm. And um, sometimes uh, entrepreneurs feel like you know, they're in the wrong place at the wrong time and they want some help from somewhere and so they throw out a lifeline and that's what I did. Mm -hmm. uh, and it worked out fine, 
it just didn't add any value. Okay, Carl, worst decision and what you learned from it? Uh, so I had a little chance to think while these guys talked. <laughs> uh, it's probably not doing enough due diligence on the person that a guy uh, named Bob was at Navigant, okay? At that time, it was. Uh, <laughs> at that time, it was. It, it was not called Navigant, but uh, uh, that man was not uh, a good human being, and I uh, had the wool pulled over my eyes. So did everybody else, and we trusted some people that uh, were uh, very high level at Berkeley University professors who said, yes, you know, come on in to this company, we're gonna be great partners. But uh, uh, that ended up taking SDG. We, we were, went inside that company. Uh, we had the best two quarters of SDG ever. And within a short time of his personality and what he was willing to do and uh, taking a, a, an empowered culture and taking it into a company where somebody says, if you don't do what I do, I'm going to shoot you, okay? And this man was very proud that he had been dropped behind enemy lines in Vietnam and the way you got a village to be compliant is to shoot someone on the basis of just intimidating everybody else. And uh, he one time said to me, and Carl, if you don't do what I want, to, want you to do, I'm going to shoot Tom Keelan. And Tom Keelan at that time was the number two in running the whole strategic business of that company. Okay? Uh, the people that got it inside SDG found it so painful that we lost relatively quickly high talent and ultimately by the time uh, we pushed that guy out uh, and we went through a transition we took the remnants of SDG back out which was about a quarter of what we had gone in with within a matter of two years. Hmm. So uh, is, I, I asked myself often afterwards could I have found out more about him? What should I have done? Uh, in fact, almost all of my angel investments that didn't go well were also ultimately people issues. Okay, most of the, the, the business ideas were good, that things could change, but uh, somehow uh, what I've learned over time is you really want to do due diligence and understand the range of uh, behaviors and know those people well, like you're saying, Jim, uh, it's really important you understand who the person is. And, and people can show well, and even if they show well and you choose, you're lucky if you have a 50% uh, rate in terms of having a star. Okay? So it's like investment. Right. So we've got a question from the audience here, and kind of building off your thought, uh, Carl, in terms of like doing it for yourself, and you've got this taste for you know this level of quality, and you know practically speaking, it's going to be something different. So maybe I'll start with you, Jim. So how do you manage the need for speed in decision making, given that DA is intensely analytical? Uh, okay. Well, I don't. Uh, I don't. Here's let me tell you. I don't believe the any uh, the best decision analysis in the world is not going to help you. Uh, with, if you're, it's the wrong frame or the wrong alternatives. So I think they're probably including the frame in there in that question. But, um, you know, we kind of look at it like you have as much time as you have to make this decision. How can we help you achieve the highest quality that we can in the time that you have? And I think if you use that as your guide, then, uh, you know, these people that say DA or DQ is slow, um, I think that's a real problem for us. They're, what they're doing is saying, well, it's not a, I've had people at this conference, not this year, say, you know, it's, it's not an application of DQ or DA if it doesn't have a decision tree in it. And it's like, I, I'm trying to get that decision maker to make the highest quality decision they can in the time that they have. That's my goal. What we do in whatever time we have is going to be based on the needs of the decision, right? It should be based on the needs of the decision 
we shouldn't be trying to fit the decision to the process, we should be trying to fit the process to the decision. And I think if that's your mindset, then this is incredibly fast. It's when we, we want to take the problem in our own uh, comfort zone. You know, I like to do trees, so I'm going to do a tree. Or I like to build influence diagrams, so I want everything I see is, well, let's do an influence diagram. <laughs> that's where we get into problems as a profession. And that's particularly uh, important in my company where it's all about fast decisions. You know, that's decision making velocity is, is all anyone wants to hear. Um, and when you come in, you say, I want you to help you make a high quality decision, that sounds like I'm the chief slowdown officer. <laughs> okay? So you have to find ways to have a conversation about. Uh, that gets them excited about making timely, high-quality decisions, because you should deserve. But you deserve both. I think the word "timely" is really key here. Uh, a decision, and in the frame, you got to get that timeliness defined. So, if it's not timely, it's worthless. So, uh, the the thing that I'd like to add, because I agree with uh, what Jim is saying here, is. I look at decisions much more in a workflow or flow uh, today. Uh, decision makers don't just have one decision to make. We know how to analyze one and pull it out and then we do DQ on it. But uh, we try to drive things with what decisions should we be making and that becomes a decision agenda and then we say, okay, what's timely and what's appropriate. And in, in uh, respect to this being able to be fast and timely on key decisions. You can get so decision ready with either the models like you're doing with your investments or with the data being decision ready. A lot of this decision, this data intelligence is a matter of understanding what decisions we're likely to serve and being prepared so that we don't have to do a lot of new work, we're, we're becoming decision ready. And I think the idea of both models, uh, you know, tools, people, consciousness, capability and organization, uh, understanding how to form up and do this in a day because of what they're doing, all that decision readiness to me is a, a, an important design part of all of this. Okay? So, Decisions can be made very rapidly, very smartly, with the right kind of decision support systems and information intelligence readiness. Okay. So, so Carl, just a, along those lines, so if you think about like your leadership style, so if you were sort of like step outside yourself and reflect back on how you lead, what elements of decision analysis have you just internalized so much it's like a daily habit for you? So you're just decision ready because these things are uh, second nature. For me personally, decisions, outcomes, framing. Uh, decisions and outcomes, framing, uh, making sure the alternatives, and then looking quickly for what's the bottleneck here. Are we, uh, are we data rich? Uh, are we resource rich or resource poor? What, you, know, it, you very quickly do a diagnostic and you have a feel for what might be the missing part. And I know I apply that in personal decisions and helping others that are friends on, on a daily basis. And it's like, wow, how, how, how do you know so much about my situation? I know nothing about your situation. <laughs> I just have a, a decision prepared mind. Yeah. Right. You know? It's just the way to think. I'd like to hear Victor's answer, but I just want to uh, add on to that. You could have the most complex decision that your executive has ever faced, and they have two hours to make it. What are you going to do? You have to have an answer to that question. You can't just say, well, you know, in three weeks, I can give you a really great strategy. <laughs> I think we all have to think about that um, as a way of, you know, proliferating what we do. So, so, yeah, so how about you, Victor? Does this speed or decision prepared mind, is that relevant to you at all? Absolutely. And, and I've walked into many situations where everybody was prepared to do a months long analysis on a decision and we were able to actually whiteboard the thing and make a decision in two hours. So 
I think that the premise of the question is wrong, that the idea that we absolutely have to use specific tools in order for it to be decision quality uh, is just not what decision analysis or decision quality is about. Um, we have the opportunity to help decision makers, just as, as uh, my colleagues here have said. And so if we focus on that, we use what's appropriate for the decision we have to make. So, so I want to stick with Victor for just a moment. So, so in addition to, so you've got this kind of decision analysis, decision prepared mind, I like that concept. What other frameworks have you found to be influential that you've paired with decision analysis in your leadership roles? Well, goodness. So uh, just about everything out of scouting. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the, the patrol method, right? It, it's, it's all about a team and a team working together and communicating in a team and having different roles. Uh, all, all of the frameworks around um, understanding roles. Because as we all talked about, all of our hardest decisions are all about people. None of them have been about resources, right? Whether we were going to lose $5 million or $50 million, at the end of the day, that, that doesn't really matter. What, what really matters is the people and how we feel and, and what we're um, creating and changing. And so all of the most difficult decisions have all been around people. And so all the people frameworks that I can leverage are the most important ones for me. Okay, DA plus scouting. How about for you, Jim? DA plus? Uh, well, I, I would point out two. Um, uh, one is uh, Lean Startup. If you haven't checked out Lean Startup, I would, I would take a look at that. Um, you know, in situations where you can do stuff, see what happens, learn very quickly and very cheaply, and, and, and that's a way to deal with uncertainty, right, um, in certain situations. Uh, the other one that my team has gotten a lot of benefit out of that I would encourage you all to check out is called The Four Disciplines of Execution. It is a Covey um, product. But, um, you know, uh, we, we focus a lot on getting the person to commitment to action, right? Then there's all this stuff that happens about actually executing that decision that we kind of, you know, we wash our hands with and we go off and work on the next decision. But, you know, my team actually has to execute stuff as we go drive DQ. And we kept finding that we had these great ideas and all the stuff we wanted to go do, and we just weren't getting it over the, the finish line. And so um, 4DX, or the, the four disciplines of execution, I would encourage you all to check out. It's really powerful. Um, as long as you don't cut corners. You gotta, you gotta really do it the whole way. <laughs> but it, it works. So Carl? Uh, for me, it's the uh, behavioral Pre, a descriptive part of the human nature that relates to decision making. And it includes both the cognitive or the, the psychology, as well as the sociology, as well as the bigger thing. So uh, Kahneman talks about system one and system two, the fast mind, the slow. And then people add the social behavior stuff of uh, groupthink and all the things that happen with, with group behaviors. The thing that we all do, those groups don't study, which is none of us would solve four equations, four unknowns, without tools. It, 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 yet, this whole decision uh, assistance that we do is expanding beyond what goes on in our behavioral self and reaching out to what we call system three. Okay, so when you reach outside. That whole ball of wax, of what is human nature and what happens without our methodology, which is the baseline from which we have to understand where people are, and the difference between that and what we can do by our larger mindset of decision quality is huge. But you gotta understand that base field and see what's happening now and why it's happening. And uh, so this is, all this biases and behavior stuff, to me, has become as big of a part of my understanding and life in, in terms of this decision focus. I'd add disruption theory, too, by Clayton Christensen. Um, I think what, what's happening with data science right now is disruptive to our profession. And so how are you going to respond to that? And I think we could use some of the lessons there to figure out how we 
um, you know, help those people uh, not waste, you know, no one wants to waste their time, no one wants to do work that isn't used. Right. We can help those people, help their work actually make a difference. Mm -hmm. And I think we have to, that's why this conference is themed the way it is, because we need to address it as a society. Uh, and I'm hoping this is the start of it. Great. All right, so we're running low on time, so last question here. Um, so walk us through, or give us, give us an a, a example of when your belief in decision analysis has given you the courage of your convictions in the face of a challenging situation. Selling a company. I mean, <laughs> say, say, say more. Yeah, so, so every, every time you're looking at the decision, you know, you've, you always have the decision to divest, right? Wh whatever it is that you're doing in life, you always have the decision to exit. And so you have to keep in mind that that's a, a decision in front of you. Uh, and without decision analysis, it's a very, very difficult decision to make because you don't understand the values, you don't understand the impacts on not just you know, the financial uh, impacts, but all of the other impacts on the people that are gonna go. I mean, you, you, know, you, you walked into a very bad situation and uh, even having decision analysis didn't sufficiently help that situation. And that exit situation is such a very high, um, very high uh, impact decision that decision analysis really enables making that decision without feeling like uh, you're going to do something wrong. Jim? Uh, we're, we're doing it right now. So uh, my team is going, we are going to become data science and artificial intelligence experts. Do we know the first thing about that? No. Uh, but I know that there's just some fundamental things about how the world works, like decisions versus outcomes, and you know, um, and that analysis without the you know, information that won't change a decision has no value, right? There's these things that are principles of our profession that tell me that we can go lead in that space versus just let them come in and take it from us. And so that's what we're going to go do. Right. Carl, when has decision analysis given you the courage of your convictions in the face of a challenging situation? I think if things make really sense, it's a lot less required to have courage. Okay? Mm -hmm. Courage is much easier <laughs> if, you're on the, if you know you've thought it through and, and so on. I think it be really becomes a courage issue when you say, I can't think it through. I have to make a decision now. And in the moment, I have to do that. Uh, uh, and yes, those things happen. Uh, I once, as a young person, as a teenager, uh, had to make the choice of am I jumping in with all my clothes on to save somebody that came off an ice float? Hmm. And yes or no, okay? And there wasn't any time, and I did it. And luckily, my friends were around to help pull me out because I couldn't have made it back up the bank. But when I asked people, you know, would you do it? Do it not? Oh, everybody was amazed at the courage. I didn't think at all. I just kind of did, right? The right thing to do. And, and those are the situations we come into. Yeah, I think one of the ways to look at our profession is how do you help people make yeah. tough decisions and be at peace with their choice? Yeah. By, yeah. by the way, Carl, I think you've got scouting potential, just so you know. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so let's thank our guests. <laughs>